And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engi. Engi and then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep goats by the way where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David, David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his uh, servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the king... And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. Uh, here, uh, David and his men had been on the run from Saul. Saul tormented David. He was jealous of David and he wanted to kill David. And he knew, he knew at one time that David would be the king. And Saul wasn't ready to give that over to David. So what I what I read in here, in this big cave, David had his chance. He had he had a choice to make inside this cave. He could kill Saul, and he could he could be he, he could be king sooner. Or he could seek God's will, what God wanted David to do. And I believe he did what God's will was, and he just cut a little piece of the the cloth from uh, his his robe, uh, Saul's robe, just to let Saul know that he could have killed him if he wanted to. And, you know, every day, I, I believe we're faced with decisions that we have to make. And sometimes uh, we may make the wrong decision because we haven't sought God's guidance, the Holy Spirit leading us. And sometimes whenever we make a decision, uh, a decision that we think in our minds may be good for us, but not, it's not. Because we have limited view of what our decisions will be, the consequences of our actions. We have a limited view, but God has full view. He, has, he knows exactly everything in present and past and future. He sees everything. So who, who other is there to go to, to help us to make decisions. You know, this morning we made a decision to come to church. Uh, I believe that's God's will. For Satan not to sin and of yourselves. Yeah. So that was a decision that we made. It was a good decision. But it could have been easy for us to decide, well, we lost an hour of sleep. We just sleep in this morning. Which would be wrong for us to do. I believe God blesses us whenever we seek Him. And when we know His will, and we know His will because we know His Word. Amen. The more we get into His Word, we'll know exactly what decisions God wants us, how He wants us to go, because it's in the Word. If we get in it, read it, and study it. Uh, so this morning, I, I want to encourage us uh, not to make quick decisions on tough issues that we have, either at home or at work or dealing with uh, kingdom work. Uh, let us take our time. Uh, let us pray and seek God's wisdom, His, His guidance, and that will always be right because God will never steer us in the wrong direction. He loves us too much for that. Uh, Sunday school classes may be
so in sad exile was out on life's sea. So burdened in sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, Make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul. In the haven of rest, I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Oh, come to the Savior, He patiently waits to save by His power divine. Again, we're all, I hope we're all very thankful to be here. Uh, we'll be in the book of James, the first chapter. And we'll start about the 25th verse. Again, it's important for us as Christian people to remember uh, so many denominations and so many different ideals are out there. That I've been saved, I'm okay, don't worry about it. Uh, but the Bible teaches us as Christian people uh, we have a duty. And you say, well, no, no, no. He said, uh, salvation is free. Salvation was free. It was a gift. But through that, God expects us to be obedient to his word. Sounds so simple. Just be obedient. Uh, but as Brother Robert brought it up this morning, uh, we being human, we've got choices. We have to make everything. Sometimes those, those choices are not obedient to the Word of God. But as, as we go through here, we, we, we find out that uh, hearing the Word, knowing the Word is not enough. We've got to be doers of the Word. So in the 25th verse of the first chapter of James, it said, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We'll stop there just for a second. Question or comment? This is the part that we want to leave out being human. You know, uh, if you do something that's against the word of God, it's terrible. But if I do it, it's not that bad. You know, because I've been saved by grace. The simple truth is, James is telling us again, if you look into the perfect law of liberty, and we are, the new dispensation, uh, 
uh, that Jesus Christ brought to us is free. It's, we're at liberty. We're not tied down by the rites and the rituals of the Mosaic law. But again, if you look carefully, it says what? And continue with therein. It's not enough to know it. It's not enough, you know, to say, well, I've been saved and it's free. Uh, we can't be a forgetful here. The Word of God has to be placed in our heart. And if it is, we'll be blessed. Uh, a, a lot of the, the big evangelists today, the TV preachers tell you, that blessing is that you'll be rich, healthy, wealthy, wise, all these things and nothing to come upon you. But that's not what the Word of God says. It says we'll be blessed. We're blessed, or I'm blessed this morning. I don't know how you feel about it. I'm blessed because I'm able to get out and come to church. I'm blessed that I woke up. I, I, was, I woke up this morning able to get out of bed. Think about it. How many people are out there that would love to leave their sick bed? To leave a bed that maybe they've been in for years. Just can't walk. If they can't get around. How much of a blessing is it for us that are able to get out and do what? Pretty well what we want to do. And, that, and that's, that's what it's teaching. It's, it's, it's teaching obedience brings, it sounds silly I guess in a way, but obedience brings the promises of God to us. And we're all a Christian people. We're all standing on that promise. In uh, 1 John, the 14th chapter, no, I'm sorry, in John, the 14th chapter, the 15th verse, it says, if you love me, keep my commandment. Again, like I say, so simple. But that's what Jesus said. If we claim to be a Christian, we say we love Jesus. And what's expected of us, what's our duty? To keep the word of God. Then 1 John 5 and 3, it says, For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. It's throughout the word of God, the New Testament, that we should be obedient. It's just that simple. A life of obedience and repentance is what God expects of his people. Uh, the obedience is one thing. Then you say, well, what about the repentance? Well, the repentance because we're human beings and we're not always obedient to what God would have us to do. Anybody have a question or comment? If any man among you seem to be religious and bridle lift not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Question or comment on these verses. See, again, you know, we, 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 we've taught this, uh, Brother Justin's preached on it, and, and even Brother Roberts covered it several times when he started Sunday school. Uh, it's not so much what I say as it is what I do. You know, everybody claims that they believe, well, not everybody, but the majority of people say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus as the Son of God, not being saved. But their lifestyle doesn't show it. Uh, and what to say? You know, again, if I can't keep my mouth shut, if I can't control myself, no matter what I tell you, my religion is in vain. It's not any good. Just because I, you know, the, the old saying is, uh, Especially in, in old western stuff, he cast a long shadow. You know, uh, people, 
people look, they seen him for, you know, that's what they see, that long shadow, what a great person they was. But the simple fact that God knows. God knows who we are, what we are, and there's a true and a false way to serve God. And James is bringing that. Pure religion is what? Undefiled before God. The Father, and the Father, is this. The day of the fatherless and widows and their afflictions. I'm going to stop right there at that part. A question and comment on this so far. We're to have compassion. We're to take care of our own expression. And then, uh, in the church, if there's a widow, an orphan, uh, we're to take care of them, and then as our neighbors, people that we know, we're obligated to help out. It's just you know, it's just that simple. Uh, a lot of times, well, I don't have time. It's not my job. It's not my job. Let somebody else do it. If they're in trouble, if they're in trouble, it's our job to ease that burden. You say, well, that's, that's not too bad. I can do that. But then now here comes the hard part. And again, James bringing this out. We got sympathy. You know, uh, we, we, we do our part to help people in need. We pay our tithe. We give our offerings. But then he finishes it off with what? And to keep himself unspotted from the world. There's the hard part. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You, you know, a, a, a widow lived down the street. <clears throat> when I read this, I think of an old lady. There's an old lady living alone. You know, you go by and maybe cut her grass. You, you know, you, you help out when you can. That's not that hard. The hard part is keeping myself Uh, the world can sneak in very fast. We say, oh, I don't, I, I would, I'm not going to stand. I'm not going to get caught up in things in the world. But uh, well, you better stay in the house, stay on your knees, and pray. And study the word of God. Because when you leave the house, I don't become part of the world, but I'm not in the world. And it's very hard to be around people this, this day and age especially. And not get caught up in the sin that they're so easily caught up in. Anybody have a question or comment? If not, we'll move on to uh, chapter 2. Again, as, as we tried to bring out before, uh, even before we get to the, before we got to the book of James, uh, my Christian faith. My testimony, your testimony, is judged by the world. But how do we treat everybody? And I would love to tell you <clears throat> this morning that uh, I have no biases in my life. But I'd be lying. Uh, I, I'm not particularly biased on different uh, people of different color, different cultures, but I'm biased on, uh, and, and that's a fault of mine, uh, I judge a lot of people because who they look like. <laughs> you know, Lord help me, I, I know it, but if, if you, if, you know, I, I judge mostly if you look like somebody I know that That I have doubts of being a Christian or whatever or how they've treated me in the past or how they've done somebody else I'm quick to say look at and, and I tell me all the time people on television I don't like them why they look like so and so we gotta be careful not to respect 
anyone above anybody else. You know, uh, and that's what James is going to get into here because people will, the world will judge us on everything, if, you know, anyway. But especially if I have a prejudice or if I have a uh, whatever against a particular type of people, they'll pick up on that faster than anybody else. Say, God's got to love. You say you love. Love your neighbor. And they'll bring that up, throw it in your face. So we've got to be careful what we do and how we do it. Chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For, there, for, for if there come unto you assembly, under your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Set thou, set thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or set here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves? and are become judges of evil thoughts. Question or comment? He brings this out as far as what we would say rich and poor. Uh, the world as a whole treats somebody that's got a lot better because the truth is, let's, you know, let's be honest, if they're rich and got a lot of power and all these things, you treat them better because they might be able to help you in the future. Now, some poor old bum like me, you say, well, hi, what can he do for me? And we automatically make a distinction between the two. Uh, I've known people that had a lot, and perfect, the, 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 the honest truth is I didn't care much for them. Some people that's got it, everything that we as human beings think, oh, that's, they've got it made. Uh, a lot of times they're not very friendly, they're not very good, and a lot of times people we look at and say, they don't have you know, they just don't have nothing. Uh, maybe they're a little, their clothes are a little dirty. They're just a little uh, dirtier than we think they are to be. A lot of times, that's the person that's really going to help you. That's the person that cares for you. But we can't make a distinction uh, uh, of people that come through our church doors and go shake a certain group's hand and then another group of people come in and turn their backs on. It, it, it just can't be done. Uh, it, in Proverbs, the 30th chapter, 8th and 9th verse, it says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither po poverty or riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full of the night. And say, who is the Lord? Or let, or at least I be poor and steal and take the name of my, my God in vain. Choices. Brother, Brother Robert brought that to his book. Choices. I don't know of a person. And, and there's nothing wrong, I believe, uh, to want more than what say what we grew up with that's what your parents want they want you to be a better person than they were they want you to have an easier life maybe than they did uh, but it's wrong to be so vain that I've got to have everything that somebody else has Bible calls it covetousness. 
all we need to do as Christian people, and, and, it, and it's not, it's not always easy. Because the fine line here that he's talked about in Proverbs, the smartest man that I guess was ever on earth, King Solomon. If you've got too much, what do you do? You thank too much of yourself. You're not thankful for what you've got because I've got everything I need more. And then he brings out the same side. You flip the coin over and what is it? I'm so poor that I've got to steal and do things wrong to feed my family. Then what you do, just as it said, you take God's name in vain. There's a fine line of what it is and what we should be doing. Uh, in Leviticus, the 19th chapter, the 15th verse, that ye shall do no more unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. It's not wrong, say, for me not to like Sister Angie. If she done me the wrong, you know, and I've done everything to get it together, it's not wrong for me not to want to be around her. I'll put it that way. But it's wrong for me to treat her wrong. Does that make sense? You know, I hope I'm saying what I'm trying to say. It's wrong. I don't have to like everybody. The Bible doesn't expect us to like everybody. The Bible teaches us to you know, uh, live peacefully with everybody. But it also goes on to say, you know, that everybody's not going to allow you to be good to them. We need to understand that our judgments has to be done on that person through the Word of God. You know, and, and I've, all, I've said it, I know people that so I've got friends that have never claimed to be Christians but treated me just as good as anybody could. And you say, care what you say. I don't care what you say, what you think. He's always been good to me. We've all got people that way. And that's what we have to do. And if somebody treats you wrong, it's up to us to pray to God for that person. Try to make it right. If they can't make it right, you pray for them. But you don't get up and say, you know what they did to me? You know how low down and dirty they are? We should respect the rich, the poor, the good, the bad with a righteous judgment. And there's where we get in trouble again because what? We're human beings. It's on the personal level. I know people that uh, could take a lot more than I can. But I also know people, those people that things that bother me, that they say, ah, that's nothing. Some little thing that I think, some little minor thing, they snap like crazy. A totally different thing that I don't see much to me. I remember when Dad was a uh, pastor in St. Louis, uh, they had a, a city jail ministry. City jail only kept about 1,500 people. Uh, they didn't bring them out into a hall. It, you had to go into the cells or buy the cells. It, it was so bad they wouldn't let them out. Because you didn't know who was all that. I mean, they had murderers, pickpockets. You know, everybody was mixed and you couldn't really separate who might do damage. So he took him into one cell block. He got to stand out in the hallway. <coughs> All the prisoners walked up to the bars. He opened his Bible and started reading his Bible. And it just so happened one of the prisoners stood there and hacked up a big throat full and spit right between his eyes, right his forehead. Uh, 
He closed his Bible, walked off, and never went back. He said, I can't do that. There's people that, that there's other preachers that been spit on. They went back. They could take it. He said, I'll be in jail myself. The good Lord doesn't expect me to take that. You know, that's what he said, and I believe him. Uh, he, it wasn't in his personality to take that. He went because he knew these people in jail were just like the rest of us. They were sinners. Had done wrong, but he also knew God loved them and they needed to hear the word. But after that point, he never went back to the city jail. He went to some prisons and stuff, but he didn't go to the city jail again. But what Jamie is telling us again, we have to respect, not because of their position, but who they are. Anybody have a question or comment on that? If we're not careful, the problem in that is, is the evil thoughts that we have. Verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brother, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heir of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor, Do not the rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by, by the which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Question or comment? See, James is trying to be just as what well, he is. He's just as honest as he can be in bringing forth the word. Because <coughs> as I read this and, and uh, I thought on it, I've known people, I've known Christian people that had been Christian, say, 50 years. And they would tell a hey, newer Christian, you don't know nothing. I've been a Christian 50 years. I've been coming here 50 years. You keep your mouth shut. It's none of your business. Think about that. That's what he's trying to get across here is those in power. And it's always been in this world, there's always has been, and I believe as long as the world stands, there's going to be the haves and the have nots. The haves want to keep what they got, and the have nots wants part of what they've got. It's human nature. But if we want to be the Christian we should be, if we don't want to blaspheme the name of God. We have to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you do that, you do well. He did not say you could do this every every day of your life. Everybody you come in contact with, you're human. Things is going to happen. Things are going to get in our way. But the simple fact of it is we know if we have respect of persons. No question. No doubt, not what I think, no, it's not what anybody else thinks, it's what saith the word of God. If we have respect to persons, ye commit sin. We also know the Bible tells us what? No sin shall enter in. So this tells us what? We're obligated by the word of God To repent of such things. We've all been, if I like to tell you I've never been guilty of it. But I have. I'm human. But I've had to repent of that. I've had to ask God to forgive me. Uh, 
where I had done wrong. We cannot be partial. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't say I can't like one person more than I do somebody else. We all got, you know, we've all got people that we care just a little more for. But we can't show it. That's what it's telling us. We can't treat them different. Somebody that that we're real close to, somebody that's, uh, <coughs> say, family or, or, or just a good friend, somebody we've known for years, somebody we respect for whatever reason, we can't treat them any different than somebody that just walked in the door. That's what, that's what it's telling us. And that's the hard part. We have to understand that we don't want to be transgressors of the law. But right here, James has defined what sin that is. So, that, so, so you know, the hard part of it is we being humans and hard headed, we want to discuss it, we want to argue around it, but this is plain. Sin for us in black and white. It's a sin. You know, I don't have to like it. Uh, you don't have to like it. But we have to know it's sin. Any question or comment? For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he, for he that said, do not commit adultery, he said also, do not kill. Now, if, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and do, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath shewed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. I'm going to stop here just for a second. Question or comment? Again, as, as Christian people, uh, James just tells us again, I, and, and I hate to use this word because it, it, it seems uh, like it's going against the liberty and, and, and the, the freeness of salvation. But once again, he's showing we're obligated to the Word of God. We're obligated to do what the Word of God says. No matter what I think, what you think, no matter who it is, we need to understand that, uh, again, plain and simple, we're going to be, really, we're going to be judged according to our works. Anybody have a question or comment on what this? Again, you say, well, now, I ain't killed nobody. You know, I haven't committed adultery. Look at me. I'm a good old boy. But if I have respect to person, I should, I, I just as well. In the eyes of God, it had been the same if I had killed or committed adultery. Still the same sin, and if you commit one, you're guilty of all. Any question or comment? If not, I thank you for your kind attention.
can't fight it. Jacob in the days of old I wrestled with the Lord and in stunned with a courage bold I stood upon his word I would not be denied I would not be denied till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. Old Satan said my Lord was gone and would not hear my prayer. But praise the Lord, the work is done and Christ the Lord is here. I would not be denied. I 
one twenty six. Alas, indeed, my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of The trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved birds shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is caught up yonder, when the roll is caught up yonder.
Christ the blessed Savior with heart and with voice. Tell him how we came to love him and make him our choice. That will be a glad reunion day. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and loved ones who stay. That will be a glad reunion day. When we live a million years in that wonderful place. Asking in the love of Jesus, beholding his face. It will seem but just a moment of praising his grace. That will be a glad reunion day. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and That will be a glad reunion day. Anybody else have?
Anybody else have a special this morning? I, I was thinking to myself and kind of got myself chuckling. It's funny and everything, but uh, uh, I remember Granddad telling me a while back, uh, Granddad Bracker, when he first started preaching, was down uh, in Dresden, and I believe it was at Salon there for a little while, and, and before he ever pastored or anything like that, and he went over to a man's house for dinner on Sunday, and, uh, and, I, and I guess he just started preaching, and he got up there, and he was leading singing that morning. That old man told him, he said, he said, son, he said, I just want to give you some advice. He said, uh, he said, you better stick to the lead singing. <laughs> so I was thinking about that. I was like, I wonder what he'd think about me, but I can't do either one of them. But I, I enjoy uh, singing for the Lord. And, uh, you know, I was kind of, this uh, past weekend, we was, we was just kind of uh, thinking about some scripture in our mind and our heart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought a lot of times about the song the Lord lays on our heart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't get up and sing as much as I, as I probably should and everything. And, uh, you know, I'm probably not going to sing this morning. But, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, though, that tune in my heart, uh, you know, the song that is. Uh, this past week, I found a CD uh, of the primitive, and we put it in a truck when we was going to work back and forth with Medina and everything. And uh, you know, I, I just miss that good old gospel music. I, you know, it seems like now with everything's been going on, you know what? We get away from that singing so much, and don't have our fifth Sunday singings like we used to, and things like that. And I just miss, uh, you know, what the words that are in the songs, and uh, you know, because I know it's the gospel, and I believe that the Lord deals with us that way. Uh, so, you know, today, uh, as we go throughout the service, Brother Ryan's going to be bringing the message here in a little bit. And, uh, uh, you know, what we, uh, we're going to tonight turn out for uh, Prospects Revival and everything, so you'll be remembering them in your prayers. And uh, uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to do anything other than this, but, I, you know, I was just I was sitting there and I was thinking about having that good old song in your heart. I believe that Sunday morning can be the time that we can come in and uh, get, get all things in order. Uh, you know, I don't believe it takes this church house to do that, uh, but you know what, today set aside and dedicated, and we talk about that all the time. Uh, but now's the time we use that because, you know, that little song uh, that we have in our heart, uh, you know, when we come in the house of God and we set things in order and meditate upon Him for a little while, I believe it can continually play throughout the week. Uh, you know, I know a lot of things are going on right now, a lot of trouble and heartaches and things that we're facing, uh, but you know what, if we can get that little song just to, just to play it on Sunday, uh, you know what, I believe it can carry us throughout the rest of the week and uh, I keep our heads up, uh, you know, because we we're in a time right now where we need something to pick us up. And I, you know what, the Lord's always done that for me, and I know He does it for you. And uh, I, you know what, just remember that, that any time you're down and out, I, you know what, I can always go back to a few songs that I've got that I've heard in time past, and that reminds me of every time what the Lord can do for me. And it does lift me up. It changes my attitude. It changes my tone a lot of times in life. So, uh, you know what, that's just kind of something that the Lord laid on my heart this week. Has anybody got anything they want to say or do? Any more songs, testimony, prayer requests, anything? But we change the service. If not, why ask Brother Ron who would lead us in a word of prayer and after that we'll turn it over to Brother Ron. Our most kind of grace and Father the Lord as we come once again, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of life. So we ask you, precious Father the Lord, we do on this part of the service, Lord. If you lift Brother Ryan up, Lord, let him preach the message that we stand in need of. We just ask you, precious Father, once again, to remember all those that do your bounces to pray for. We ask you, precious Father Lord, again, Lead God directly to our lives, Lord, that we might be better Christians tomorrow than all we were today. So we just again, Lord, thank you for everything you have done to both of all, Lord. We want to thank you for what you do. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Christians, but they they live, they try to do it in church. But when they get out of church, it's, it's just another another day. They don't even think about God. It seems like so we, we need to realize that uh, it ain't just a Sunday salvation. It's an every day. It, it's a, it's a uh, it's important to go out and show others the word. 
and that, that, that is to live it each day. We, uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn into uh, Matthew 18, verse 7. A lot of times in life, we, uh, we hang on to things, but we, we start to, we, 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 we may not mean to, we might not mean to let something get a hold of us and veer us from what God wants us to do or, or get to His Word. But sometimes we, we allow things in life to disrupt what we need to do for the Lord. So if that happens, this is what it's telling us to do. We need to uh, get rid of it, cut it off, and leave it alone. So let's start reading in Matthew 18 and 7. Woe unto the world because of offense, for it must needs be that offense come, but woe to that man be whom for whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life all remaining, rather than to have two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into fire. So this morning we we got to realize that if something is in our life that does not need to be there, we need to get rid of it. If there's something that is keeping us from giving everything we have to the Lord, get rid of it. It's not literally saying cut off your foot or pluck your eye out or your hands, but I mean if it's necessary, then so be it. But if this is pretty much talking about anything that's in your life that is not godly or that is preventing you to serve God, get it out. Clean it out, get a full, clean slate, and that right there is time to work within your heart. And so, that is time you done got rid of everything away from the world, all the sin, you, you are right with the Lord. So what do you do? You've done cleaned your house. You make sure it's right. So what do you do from there? Preventive. I mean, you, you got to take preventive measures. You, you got to you got to put a security system. I mean, you got to make sure that God is number one and that He's He's uh and that you're allowing Him to keep everything in the world out. That's right. So if we don't do that, then we're bound to have a break, a uh, a crap. We, we've been watching a lot of DIY stuff, and and that uh if if you don't if you don't uh prep the foundation right. Well, eventually, you're going to get water seeping in. And what happens when water seeps in? Destruction happens. And when the destruction happens, it, it may start out just a little bit. But over years and time, it, it's going to start busting that foundation. So what, what, what have we done there? Our, our, our lives isn't uh, set on God's foundation. It ain't set on a good foundation. You haven't set up a barrier and, and a, a... Just... just we got to let God lead us. That's right. So if you haven't set up a good foundation to serve God, we better get there and make sure that there's nothing that's going to creep in. If we allow something to creep in, it will damage. It will start to affect our attitudes. It, it will start to affect how others think of us. That's because right. once we start getting uh, things in our mind, it starts coming out. If bad things start getting on our mind, it starts coming out and people start seeing that. You might not realize that. You may not realize, well, people ain't going to know about that. They ain't going to, well, they'll, they'll start seeing it. They'll start seeing it and then, well, guess what? You're starting to be a stumbling block to others. That's right. But to yourself, too. Make sure that there's nothing between you and God. And that's what we're, we're, we're going to start. We're going to go to Romans chapter uh, 14. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. We was going to start reading in uh, 12, but I would like to start reading in 11. For it is written, as I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Remember that. I, I don't give account for you or you to me. We are all held, held accountable in God's eyes. Amen. And that is for us. So realize that so then it, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Don't worry about, I mean, we should, we should care about others and, and the way they're living. But we need to take care of ourselves. 
But by doing that, we're going to have the love of God within us to show others about God. It, it, you see how, how it comes about, how everything that God has laid out for us to do comes about is to serve Him. And by doing that, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this way that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So we should not, we have to go out and live a godly life, but in by, in, there's a lot of different ways you can put a stumbling block in your brother's way. Let, 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 let's think of uh, a new believer, a non-believer, a new Christian. I mean, you, you, you've got so many different things that you can hurt people with. And if you say you're a Christian, you go out and you, and you say, I serve the Lord, but yeah, you've got nasty talking within your mouth. Or if you've got uh, dirty jokes, or if you've got things that uh, maybe you're not a man of your word. That's right. People start looking at that. People start seeing, oh my goodness, that, that's just not a good man. And he says he's godly. He says he, he's, he's saved. I, I, don't, I don't want to be a part of that. What is that? That's a stumbling block. You're putting, you're, you're putting something that, that if you was right with God, that could have changed your life. They could have said, hey, look at that man. He's godly. He does what God wants him to do. He, he, he is living for God. And, and I think I want some of that. Let's see, let's see about going to their church and learning about the Lord. That's how you want people to react to your life. That's right. A living sacrifice. I mean, if, if people start seeing God through you and the love that you can show one for another, they're going to start seeing that hey, I want some of that. And, and it's a good feeling. I mean, they're like, we, we see that you don't, you don't use foul language. We see that you, you recognize God in everything that you do. And you serve Him and praise Him and not what you've done. A lot, of things, a lot of times we put ourselves a little above what we think we are. So let, let's make sure put God first because a lot of times we, we want people to see, hey, look at what I've done. And people, really, they, they notice that too. So let's make sure that we give God praise in everything that we do. The young Christian, we have to be an example to them. That's right. And let them know to get in the Word of God and to study it. But if we start doing things in front of them that isn't right, they're going to start questioning what they need to do. So we need to live our life for the Lord and show them. And, and if they need help, and, and if you don't know exactly what the Word says, if you don't know exactly word for word and what it means, it's better to go into the Word before you talk to them. Don't, don't mislead them. Don't, don't miss, you know, if, if you... If you think it's right and you just go ahead and tell them, what if it's wrong? If, if you're not 100% sure that you know the word and, that, and what you're telling them is the truth, what should you do? You probably need to keep your mouth shut because it can do more harm than good. So let's make sure we know the word of God and that we're, what we're telling others is the truth. That's right. What does that lead into? False teaching. Ignorance. Pretty much. Let's not be ignorant in the Word of God. Let's let God lead us into what we need to say, not what we think we need to say. A lot of times we think, well, this is going to sound better. Let's just do it this way. Well, sometimes few words are better than long, boasting right. words. Amen. Sometimes that right there will catch somebody's attention far more than boasting words. I mean, things that just impress. Oh, this is going to sound better. Make me sound smart. I, I don't claim to be smart. And if I start using big words, I don't even know what they are. I mean, that, that might not even mean what I'm supposed to be saying. So you know what? I'm keeping this simple. Stupid simple. But you know what makes us smart? What makes us is relying on God to give us the words that we need to tell others. And that makes you smart. Not the big words you say. What makes you smart is trusting God and trusting Him in everything you do because if, you, if, you, if you, you're reliable when you're a Christian telling others about the Lord, so you're responsible to know the Word of God. 
if you start false teaching. Or some people just try to make it sound good. Bring people into the church. Hey, more money for me. That's not right. God is not pleased with that. You should want to bring people into church to show them the love that God has given you. To show them what, what, what has changed your life and then what can change their life. Let's give everything. Let's just make sure we're not sending block to another person to our ourselves. Let's get our house right and make sure that we're doing what we should for the Lord by telling others about God's wonderful gift and let them know that God is there for them. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Start in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a uh, sweet-smelling Savior. For But fornication all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as be <coughs> becometh saints, neither of filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks, for this is not that no whoremonger, nor uncleanly person, nor covetous man who is an idolater idol hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So what's that telling us? We need to live a life according to what God wants to do in foul language, talking, and all these sins does not even be a part of it. If we have something in our life that is sinful, we get it out. You can't say, well, it'll be all right right now. I need forgiveness later. But you know what? may not be a later. And once sin starts gets a hold of you, it can start taking. Like I said with the water and the foundation, it starts getting in there. It starts uh, uh, causing all sorts of different things. It's called mold in your house, which, which causes uh, sicknesses. But sin can do that too. When it creeps in, it can cause a sickness of the heart. That's right. So when you start getting a sickness of the heart, it starts going into your thoughts. And brain. I mean, it, it affects everything. And guess what? We're going to start. We'll, we'll, we'll read here in a minute in Luke 5, or Matthew 5, and we'll get a little bit more of it into that. But we need to be a lot And if when you start letting stuff like that creep in, you're not a lot for them. You're a hindrance to those who you could have helped if you was right. So what we need to do? You're right with the Lord. Tell others about the Lord. Show others the love that He's given you and that He can have. And He loves them. He may not love the sin within their life. Well, he doesn't love the sin that they're a part of. But we need to make sure that our light is shining, which we're fixing to read. In uh, Matthew chapter 5. Let's see if we can't find it first. We've got several markings. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if thy salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is this for good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under feet of men. Ye are the light of the world and city that it is set on, and hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it is, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that ye may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So why hide it? If you've got that light within you, let it shine. Let your light shine before men to let them know what you have. If you hide it, then what's the good of having it? If you hide the love to one another, it's wrong. 
We need to show each day love one for another. But most of all, the love that God will give to you. God's love is amazing. Uh, hindrances, if you, if you don't get your, if you don't show your light, it could be uh, being quiet when we should speak. A lot of times we need to speak. A lot of times we, we're too quiet. We need to be bold in what we believe. We need to tell others, oh, if, they're, if they're sinning or doing it wrong, do it in a loving way and tell them, hey, that's wrong. If you see a Christian doing wrong, uh, there's a way about doing that too. There's a wrong way about going about it too. So we need to read God's word. It tells us in here how we should do that. In love. Tell them, hey, that isn't right. I, we're not judged, but we, we, there's things in our Christian life that we need to do, that God has told us that we need to do. And if somebody is a uh, hindrance, maybe to the church, as a stumbling block to it, we need to go to them and tell them, hey, um, you're a member of this church, and the things that you're doing outside this church reflects upon this church because you're a member. But most of all, you're a Christian. You don't need to be doing that stuff. It reflects what your Christian life is. It also reflects on the church. So what do we do? We need to pray for them and let them know that pretty much they probably already do know. They just maybe have slipped away. Maybe let them know, hey, people are noticing and you need to get it right. And by doing that, what do we do? We did our job as a Christian. We did our job because... God told us to do it, and we obey. There's obedience to have. We got to have obedience in our relationship with God. If we don't have obedience with, with our relationship with God, then we need to get right. But a lot of times, people want to go along with the crowd. I preach about being a chameleon a lot. I, I think I have a few times. About how people just isn't really grounded on what they believe. That they just rather go along with whatever the crowd's doing. Say, well, they believe this, so it's all right for me to just join in and say, I, I believe it too. So what are you? What are you right there? You're not grounded in anything. First of all, you're not grounded in the Word of God because you're, you're just bound to go with anything. I just go with the flow with it. So hey, they believe that. So right now, I guess I would believe that. So, so you're just kind of adapt to whatever everybody else believes. So you don't have a belief of your own. So this morning I'm asking you to evaluate your heart and know what you believe. If you don't know what you believe, well, you know what? You can get the Word of God and trust in what He leads you to all understanding. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to go but through Him. Jesus is what we need to go through. Don't say, well, these guys believe in what Buddha or whatever, so I guess I'm just going to go over here. And I don't want to be left out. Well, you know what? Sometimes as a Christian, we're left out. But not in a bad way. If you separate yourself from sin and from what people are doing that is wrong, I don't see that being a problem at all. Because God is pleased when we're serving Him. Not pleased when we're doing things in the world. A lot of times we, 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 uh, we start thinking of the needs of ourselves and not of others. How is our light shining like that? How is our light shining if we just care about ourselves? That's what this is talking about. This is saying, hey, I'm just going to hide this away. And not let others know about it. So what? That's selfish, right? So what do we need to do as a Christian? We need to tell others about what has happened to us. That is not being a stumbling block. That is being a helper in, and a fisher of men right there. We need to be a fisher of men. We, we don't need to let anything come between us and God. And and most of all, I, I would I would hate to, to be one of those who just It's not the right time. I don't need to tell them about the Lord. I'll do it another day. And there's not another day. 
I'll, I would not want to be held accountable for that. So this morning, if you know somebody who is not in the way of the Lord, or maybe yourself, let's get it right. Let's make sure we're living the way we should for the Lord. But most of all, make sure that we're telling others about the Lord. Not, not just walking around like we're somebody. That we're above them. A lot of times they'll look at me, I'm a preacher. I'm no parent. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I've been called to preach and I do what I can. When God gives me a message and when I go come up here and preach, I'm a, I have a responsibility to preach you the truth. If I distort that in any way, then I am held accountable for that. So, when somebody ever asks me, are you nervous to come up and preach? I think there should be a little bit of nervous. But also, if you've studied the Word of God and you've done what the Lord would have you do, then you also should be pleased with yourself that you've done what God had told you to do. So let's make sure that we know the Word of God before we go out and tell others. Because it can be a stumbling block if you're, if you're not truly know what you believe and what the Word says. Let's get into the Word. Let's go to Luke 5. We'll soon close. Let's go to Luke chapter 5, verse 30. See right here, but there scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do we eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered them to them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, if we hold our life, then we're not showing others the way to go. So if we're around those that are sinning or those that isn't right with the Lord and we hide our light and we don't tell them about the Lord. It, the Word of God doesn't say to keep ourselves away from sin. Okay? It said not to be a part of what they're doing. If we go out, if we just kept ourselves in the house and kept to ourselves and just make sure that we was right ourselves, which we need to make sure we're right ourselves. What are we doing with, our, with what God wants us to do? He told us to go out and be fishers of men. He told us to go out and tell others. Now, I mean, there, I'm not, there's people who can't get out of their house. There's people who can't go. But they do make this phone, the thing with a phone. If you feel led to tell somebody about the Lord, pick up the phone and tell them. Hey, we love you. God loves you. You don't ever know how that can affect somebody's life. But most of all, if, you, if you're here today and you haven't, you've been saved, you haven't said to Christ your personal Savior, but you're living a life that isn't pleasing to Him, let's get it right. Let's make sure our life is right with the Lord. But a lot of, a lot of Christians today, they get saved at a young age, and then, then they go into to school. Well, they start hearing things about what other kids are doing, and, and they're not really focused on God anymore because they're worried about what they are thinking. So this morning, I, I, I want you to think about what God thinks about what you're doing. If you're, if you're here today and you're a new Christian, or if you, somebody who's been saved 30 years, and you're worried about what others think and not what God thinks about you, then uh, I say get in the Word of God and get in your prayer. Because uh, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can for the Lord. There, there's people today who care nothing about church. There's people today who, who come to church because they think they have to. They come to church because, hey, I'm going to put on the show. I'm going to say, well, I'm, I'm thinking about God in a way, so I'm going to come to church, and that's it. Then once you leave the church, there's nothing... It's just about the world. You don't even care about God. But that's, that's not true. 
What do you think about him every day? Do you think about the love that he's given you? Do you share that love with others? Let's think about that. If we don't, if we're not doing them things, well then we might, we might not, we, we're not right with the Lord. That may not be right. We're just not right. Let's have a concern for others. Let's have a concern for the laws. Let's have a concern and a, let's have a desire to come to God's house and to serve Him. If we don't have that desire, we need to get within our heart. But remember that God is there for you. He's there for you, and He will. And if you let Him, He will fill you with so much love that you can make a difference in this whole world. That's all we have today. That's all we have if we keep going to be of ourselves. But uh, families, one last thing. I want to say for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you do that, then you're going to set an example for your children and for your family. And by doing that, if everybody done that, the world will be a better place than they will know the love of Jesus. We love you this morning, and uh, as we get a song of invitation, if you have uh, anything within your life that needs to be resolved, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. As we have a song of invitation. Once I was walking down a lonely road, I thought I, I had no one who would share my heavy load. But then my mind went soaring back to a place I had never and I realized that I was standing at the foot of my King. Well, there were three lonely crosses on the hillside that day. And as I looked at my Savior, I cried, Lord, at me. Bye.